First Peter chapter three, turn to your Bibles. We'll be reading verses 13 to 17. Verse 13, it says this. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word, the authority of your word, Lord, let our hearts be humbled. Let our minds be humbled. Lord, let our goals, our life desires, our fleshly desires be casted out so that, Lord, your word is the authority over our lives. Father God, as we continue our series on 1 Peter, as we continue to find and discover our identity in Christ and, Lord, the suffering that comes with it, Father, will you always remind us of the suffering that your son went through just for our sakes, for our salvation. Lord, how he was quiet, how he was humble when he was arrested. Lord, when people hit him, Lord, he stayed timid and meek like a lamb led to the slaughter. Father, as we suffer, as we experience this truth in our lives, the word that we will read today, Lord, let us always remember your son who already did all these things for us, for our sakes. Father God, we thank you and we pray all these things in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Why does God allow evil to exist? Why would God command the death of so many innocent people in the Old Testament? Why does a loving God send people to hell for eternity? Why does God remain so hidden? Why does God need people to worship him? Isn't that kind of egotistical? Aren't all religions basically the same? What are some extra biblical evidence that proves Jesus really existed? How do we know that the Bible has not been changed over time? What do these questions, and many other questions similar to it, have in common? Well, for one, we know that they try to dismiss the existence of God, Christianity, the truth of Christ. But this morning, I would like you all to consider that these questions have another thing in common, is that they all have answers to them. Good ones, too, right? These questions that are meant to dismiss the existence of God, God's plans for this world, also have answers answers for all of them. In our passage today, we will continue Peter's thesis on the good of suffering, how suffering is integral to the Christian life and their identity. Suffering for righteousness sake, he says, is pleasing to the eyes of God, and it helps us grow in our trust for him, our Lord. It shows off our testimony that there is a better life to come. As I suffer, I show and reflect that there is a better kingdom worth suffering for. Today, I would like you all to consider this. Do you believe that God can use you specifically as the person to share the gospel truth with someone else that leads them to salvation? I ask that question again. Do you strongly believe, do you really genuinely believe that God can use you as a person to share, to be the catalyst in someone coming to the Lord? Do you believe that he can use you to plant the seed of truth, to water the plants, simply by answering a question in such a complete manner that reveals the truth, the complete truth of God that would actually cause them to think about Christ? to make them actually come to Christ because of what you have done in the Lord. Last week, we were challenged with the choice. Do you want to be part of the solution? Or do you want to simply dwell in the problem doing nothing? The genuine Christian believer who has been transformed by the Holy Spirit seeks to do good. The Spirit dwelling in their hearts pushes them 
to do what is godly and holy. And I would like you all to look at verse 13 with me today. Peter reminds us of his teachings from his previous chapter. Who will harm you if you live a life of doing good? So even in the secular world, despite its fallenness and its sin, even non-believers can recognize good. People still love the feel-good stories, movies, TV shows, where good wins at the end. Love conquers all. Peter reminds us, look, as Christians, if you live a life that, of doing good, most of the time, people will recognize that. And we went over that in the past chapter. Abusive husbands will recognize a wife who continues to love and submit despite how he mistreats her. Difficult bosses, cruel masters will recognize workers who continue to serve, who continue to work without complaint, even though they mistreat them. This is an integral component of offering our testimony in Christ to the world today. Being zealous for doing good. Being zealous in love, service, mercy, forgiveness, so that the world who does not know Christ will recognize those who do follow him. These things that Christ gave to us first, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, we give this to other people in the world today. And they do it even when it is difficult. Even when they're mistreated. Even when people abuse them, they will still continue to love and serve so that people will question what is going on here. What is wrong with this person? But we're reminded as well, as Peter shows us, that even when we do good, even when we are faithful to the Lord, and even when we love other people, we will still suffer for it as well. Peter's trying to show us a reality of life here that I think needs some clarification. Because sometimes I think a lot of Christians can believe that the Christian life can be described by a spectrum, right? Maybe multiple spectrums as well. For example, certain people believe that Christians need to be humble in their finances. And so the poorer you are, the more you're struggling financially, obviously you're a blessed Christian. As opposed to if you're a rich Christian, you must be greedy. You must be a selfish Christian. You must be a terrible Christian, right? So there's a spectrum even when it comes to finances. Or our spiritual disciplines. When we say, oh, I'm reading the Bible a lot more, I must be living a good Christian life. Since I'm praying so much, my Christian life is great. I read my Bible for this week, so my spiritual life by default is good. But then, when we take these spectrums, when we take this economist way of thinking, and then we're doing good, we're faithful to the Lord, and yet we suffer, then we are challenged, what is going on? Something bad happens to us, even when I was faithful, and we say to ourselves, wait a second, Lord, wasn't I not faithful? Did I not honor you in this week? Did I not serve your people and love them? What is going on? Why am I suffering for doing good? What does Peter say about that? If you look at our passage, he says what? Do not be troubled. Do not fear them. But what? In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. When suffering comes, when you do good, what does he say? Do not be troubled. Do not fear the ones who abuse you, but rather, in your hearts, continue honoring Christ as holy. Peter is showing us that a good Christian life cannot be described as a dichotomy. It is not about, I am doing so well, so my life must be good. He is showing us that, look, just because you're suffering, even, doesn't mean that you're being faithful either. Rather, it's not about your circumstances that describe your Christian faith. It is not your circumstances, what you're going through right now, that determines how good your Christian faith is right now. The key here, Peter is saying, is this. Regardless of your circumstances, Regardless of whether you're in a joyful, peaceful period of time or you are suffering for the Lord, this is the question. Are you actively pursuing the Lord in your peace and or your hardship? Regardless of your circumstances, he is saying, are you still actively pursuing Christ to follow him? 
And that's the difference between the complacent life and the growing Christian, is it not? Because the complacent Christian will stop growing. They will be set in where they are in times of good and peace. Will they not? Only when there's suffering, they're like, oh, I need to come back to the Lord. When life is peaceful, the tendency is to not seek God. When life is good, when money is good, when friends are good, we do not seek the Lord as much, do we? But if you have a heart that actively seeks the Lord, actively seeks Christian community, joyfully submitting to your spouses, your masters, then you have something special. That is what Peter is trying to show us here. Do not define your faith by your circumstances. Define your faith by how much you actively pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask yourselves that question this morning. When you wake up, when you get ready to work, when you get ready to, for church, how do you view life? How do you take upon the day after waking up in the morning, getting ready for your responsibilities? How do you respond when the day is crazy or when you're having a bad day? Peter is saying, look, the difference here is those in Christ will continue to pursue him. The other day I was reading a very good article by John Piper. He recently wrote it last week. A friend shared it with me. And he asked the question, how do you know that your faith is genuine? Right? It is a good question that I believe every Christian should ask. How do you know that you are a genuine Christian? And he speaks of Matthew 7, when we are facing the Lord someday. And to some he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. With others he will say, away from me, evildoer, I never knew you. And those who he rejects, they will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these great things in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? But then Jesus says, away from me, I never knew you. How do we know we will not be that person? Is what John Piper is asking. How do we know for sure that we will never make that terrible mistake of assuming that we are saved, ready to enter the kingdom of heaven, and then bam, the Lord says, I never knew you. This is what Piper says to answer that question. And I hope this is an encouragement for you. How do you know that you have that genuine saving faith so that you will not fear Matthew 7, 21 to 23? This is what Piper says. When you are joyful in doing the work of God. Let me repeat that. When you are joyful in doing the work of God, when you are joyful when you see Christ being glorified, you are happy, you are enjoying the Lord, your relationship with God. When you see God being glorified and worship, that is what gives you joy. As opposed to those who are hypocrites, fake Christians who do things out of responsibility and not out of love. They do church things. They do Christian things. They may prophesy. They may do mighty works in Jesus' name. They may sing out to him Sunday morning. But because they want the power, because they want the recognition, because they want the money, because they want positions of influence, or simply because they have to, because they feel like doing it. Those are the people who will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? But the Lord rejects them because they did not do it out of love. They did not do it out of enjoyment, but they did it out of responsibility. They did it out of religion. They did it because they had to. Church, I challenge you to not be that person who simply lives a Christian life out of responsibility. Do not be that person who faces the terror of the Creator saying to you, I never knew you. If you are in a position where you are living out a Christian life, out of mere responsibility, 
And there is no joy. There is no happiness to see other Christians grow. There is no happiness to see God being glorified. To see, have no happiness to see Christ as the most important thing in your life. Then I urge you to rethink your faith. Do you understand why Peter is teaching us these things today? He is saying, look, genuine Christian faith, that initial step into the faith is so important because every other act of the Christian comes and roots from that foundation. If you're doing it for religion, if you're doing it out of responsibility, out of obligation, every single act of the Christian faith is hypocritical. Do you see why now? Why the Lord tells us not to run away from suffering? Do you understand now why those in Christ will not run away when suffering comes or hardship comes? To not run away from our cruel masters or our unbelieving spouses. Do you see why real Christians, genuine believers, would actually embrace the suffering that comes in life? Because this is for the Lord. Our Lord Jesus told us in his word, we will be hated for his sake. We will be hated for he was first hated. He told us to do these things so that you are a reflection of him. This morning, do you deny yourself? Are you willing to suffer joyfully to be a reflection of Christ? To show the world that there is a greater kingdom, a greater master that I serve. I will suffer. I will endure. I will sacrifice. And I will do it joyfully for the Lord. For when you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. That's what Peter says. When you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. How? Because you will be able to relate in Christ in your suffering. The more you relate with Christ as he went on the cross to suffer for our sins, as he was carrying his cross, being mocked, being spat upon, as we relate and understand what he went through for us, can we not appreciate the love given to us more so? But when we run away from our problems, when we run away from hardship, when we run away from terrible teachers or bosses or even spouses, look what happens. We simply dwell doing nothing to solve the issue, and we never learn from the Lord. You may have heard before, experience is a good teacher. Consider the numerous sermons that we have heard about suffering. The numerous sermons we heard about how your offering and tithe is very important, how prayer is very important, how reading your Bible is very important. We hear many of those things week by week. But only when it seems like when we actually experience something. We actually go through the hardship and we say, wait a second, I have no idea what I'm doing. Why am I here? What is happening? What is going on right now? Only then it seems like we think, hmm, maybe I should change something in my life. And do you see why Satan would try to make us ignore and run away from the problems, the hardships, the sufferings. It's because he does not want us to embrace and relate to what Christ had did for us. This is why the maturing Christian believer, the Christian believer who enjoys the Lord, who enjoys Christ, they seek to train themselves and obey God's word before tragedy happens. They don't wait until tragedy to learn their lesson. They don't wait for the hardships to realize, oh, God is supreme. They're not foolish. 
They don't wait. They prepare today. God is challenging us to do the same. We prepare before tragedy happens. Think about it this way. According to scripture, God's word was sufficient enough for the creation of the universe. Right? Simply by speaking, light came into existence. The world, earth, all the plants, birds. By his word alone, things came into existence. And if this is the same word that created the universe that we appreciate today, shall we have the audacity of denying the word that says, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not steal, do not murder, obey your parents, do not worship any other gods before me. We reject the same word used to create this universe. The same God who made all these things for our appreciation, we reject it. And we say, I have a better plan, God. Mature Christians need only to the word of God to go out and do his work. That is sufficient enough. You understand that? Mature Christians only need to see God's word the same word who has given us salvation. The same word that created our hearts, our brains, the blood pumping in us. His word alone is sufficient enough for my obedience. Look at the second half of verse 15. Peter is asking his readers, what is your reason for believing in the Lord? What is your reason for suffering? Make a defense for the hope that is in you. Always being prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. There are two things that are being asked of us in verse 15. One is what we've just gone over. What is the reason why you suffer? Why is it that even though I mistreat you, even though I say bad things about you, why is it that you still love me back? Why do you still have a smile on your face, you weirdo? It's because I love Christ. I serve a greater master than you. I love you. I know you're my boss. I love you, but I serve a greater boss. Because of Christ, you will endure suffering. And because of Christ, you will be hated. But because of Christ, you will love those who hate you. You will submit to those, even those who uh, treat you unfairly. When we love, when others hate, it is challenging the worldly mentality of do what you feel. Take the easy way out. An eye for an eye. Listen to your heart. When we love, when others hate us, we are fighting against that mentality. But it leads us to our second point. Because number one is, yeah, we suffer because of our love for Christ. But Peter is also challenging us in the second point as well. He says to make a defense, always being ready to respond on why you follow, why you continue to smile in suffering, why you continue to be joyful and happy despite the cruel acts against you. Why do you continue to believe despite the questions against your faith? Why do you continue to believe in Christ even when I tell you to reject him? The answer, oh, just because it's not sufficient. It's right here. Peter is saying what? Make a defense. Always be prepared to have an answer of the hope in you. It is not about, oh, let me give you my pastor's phone number. Let me refer to you to someone else. He's saying, you Christian believer have an answer for the hope in you. Apologetics, the study of defending our faith, of course, comes from the Greek word, apologia, which, makes to, uh, which means to make a defense for. It doesn't mean to apologize for your faith. It means to make a defense, to make a statement for a belief that you hold on to. 
And I would say today, especially, apologetics is probably one of the most important things in the Christian life that we should equip ourselves with. Be careful of that phrase. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary, because that is not biblical at all. Be careful of those who say apologetics is not necessary. Because I believe Peter is being pretty clear here. Be prepared. Be prepared to make a defense for your faith. Paul says the same thing in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing. And hearing comes from the word of Christ. There is power in hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God cuts through the hearts of men. And this is one of the reasons why Sunday morning, despite all the technology, despite PowerPoint, despite all the movies we can show you, this is why we still just preach the word of God. Because we believe that it is the word of God being preached that changes the heart of man. Today, if we take upon the name of Christ... If you say that you are a believer, joyfully following Jesus today, are you equipping yourself joyfully with the Word of God? Are you equipping and training yourself to know why you hold on to the faith you claim you hold on to? Do you sufficiently know the answers to questions, especially the questions that we asked this morning? Or when people ask you about your faith, is your response silence? Church, I challenge you today to always be prepared to make a defense for the faith you believe in. For I believe strongly, even till this day, that the Lord can use you as a person to be the catalyst that plants the final seed that waters that plant so that it will finally start bearing fruit. God can use you to be that final step in someone's salvation. And what if it meant all it would take is for you to study the Word and in some simple apologetics. That's it. The salvation of one's soul simply by knowing the answer to why you believe. For those who take upon the name of Christ today, with that title, Christian, that you hold into your heart, you are declaring to the world that Christ is all that I need. That despite suffering, despite a lack of worldly things, it does not matter because I have Christ. Let me deny myself so that Christ is shown. Let me die so that I may live in Christ. If Jesus is, great, is the greatest love for you, if he is truly the most important thing in your life, let us not only suffer so that others may take notice, but let us also lovingly and gently prepare a defense for the hope that we have, why we suffer, and to show Christ is worth living for. Let us pray. As we come to the Lord in prayer, I want to encourage you to start your prayer with one question. All right? One question. How do you know you own your faith? How do you know that your faith is your own and not a borrowed faith? Simply by listening to another pastor or what other people have taught you over the years. How do you know that your faith is actually yours? Here's one simple way to respond to that. It's whether or not you ask questions about your faith. It's as simple as that. How do you know that your faith is yours and not you're just simply parroting off what people say? It is when you actively, on your own, joyfully even, seek out questions and the answers about the Christian faith where we love learning about God, where we love learning about what he has done for us. Any boy who has a high school crush 
seeks to find out everything about that girl. And if that is true, how much more greater shall our desires be in discovering about the one who has loved us in the maximum way? Seek genuine faith that causes you to deny yourself more and more each day. sacrifice of animals that does not grade us on the curve the only thing that you ask of us Lord is to have faith in what you have done for us through your son faith in your work your power Lord when we face you someday we will have nothing in our hands. We will not have our degrees, all the money that we have piled up, all of our accomplishments or our friends. We will have none of those things, Lord, when we face you. It will simply be us, naked in front of you. Everything revealed about ourselves. And if, Lord, if we, had, if we did not have Christ, what could we do when we face you that day? But because of what your son has done, because of the righteousness imputed to us through him, Lord, we are able to see you and humbly say, Lord, I do not deserve to enter your kingdom. But it was only because of my faith in your son that allows me to have a relationship with you. Today, church, I challenge you again to pray this prayer. Lord, I pray that we seek genuine faith. Lord, give us hearts that seek a heart that is broken over our sin. Lord, I pray that we seek a heart that is broken over the sins of other people because of our love for them. Lord, let us seek a heart that seeks truth, an answer in the hope that we have. And Lord, let us have a heart that joyfully does all these things because we love seeing you glorified. Father, we pray your truth and your spirit alone will do these things. And we pray that we will trust in your plans and in your timing. Work on us, Lord, no matter how slow it may be. As long as the work is yours, it will be genuine and it will be good. Thank you, Lord, for this faithfulness to us. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Stand, just sing this song.